as we continue another school year during this pandemic, or maybe, maybe Kyle, we are coming to the, dare I say it, dare I say it, uh, close to ending the pandemic. I don't know. I don't know. Well, that still has yet to be seen. But uh, educators, I think everywhere ask themselves, what do we focus on most next? And it could be next this year, uh, the remaining of this year, but it also could be like, what do we focus on next year, knowing what we've gone through in the last two years? How can we help our students get ready for that next grade level? We're going to answer that question here in this episode. Do I have enough time to teach through problem solving or should I teach through direct instruction? That's a question we're going to tackle here. What resources can I use so that I can cover the curriculum and still access deep learning? That's what we're going through. Kyle. John, we are going to be diving in here into a uh, actually a recorded webinar that we did recently. And uh, we are releasing it for you friends to dive into. Uh, for friends who want to actually see the visuals, dive in with us and like sort of pretend like you were there, uh, make sure you hop over to YouTube. This is episode 182. If you just look for 182 on our YouTube channel at Make Math Moments, you could dive in uh, because we're going to be looking at how we can reach more students and at the same time, reduce some of that stress, that anxiety, that weight that you might be feeling on your shoulders uh, in today's webinar, which uh, I hope even if you're listening, you're going to get some uh, big value from. So, John, what do you say? Let's, Let's do, do it. this. Let's do it. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. We are from MakeMathMoments.com. And we are two math teachers who, together with you, the community of math moment makers worldwide who want to build and deliver problem-based math lessons that spark curiosity, fuel sense-making, and ignite your teacher moves. That is right, my friends. Uh, right now, we're almost going to be starting from this igniting your next moves uh, idea, that part of the framework where we're going to be talking about some of the things that we want to do and continue doing as we try to reach more students after two really, really tough years in education. Uh, in particular, John, uh, we're going to make sure that we don't fall into maybe some of our old habits um, because that's what we tend to do when things get stressful, when mm -hmm. things get hard, when that pressure is on, we tend to resort to the things that we know best. And uh, I don't know about you, John, what I knew best is how I learned math. And uh, we know that that isn't necessarily going to help reach more students. So, John, in today's episode, we're going to be diving into some of the strategies, some of the tools uh, that educators can rely on. And I hope a big message, we'll talk about a big message at the end that people will take away from this webinar that's uh, being released today on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to uh, dive into this uh, with you, Kyle, and, and share this with the Math Maker community, uh, because I think after two years of teaching in such a, a, a unique situation, uh, we are left with this, where should we go next? And, and uh, I think this is going to be very helpful for everybody. So let's not waste any more time. Let's dive in. Here we go. We are excited to be here. We're going to talk uh, a lot about um, how to reach more students after these two tough years that we've been going through. We all know that they've been tough. Uh, we're going to put that aside and go, hey, what should we be doing next? Kyle, let's uh, let's get in here. Let's uh, do a couple of normal things that we do when we uh, do our presentations here online. All right. Awesome stuff, friends. Awesome. Uh, great to see who is with us here. Uh, the room is filling up, which is great to see. Uh, at the end, we've got, if you stick around and uh, you think of your biggest takeaway, we've got something to give away at the end uh, for all you awesome, awesome math moment makers out there. For those who are new to uh, with John and I and sort of the things that we try to do and share in the math community, um, we have a podcast that we've been doing for quite some mm. time. That would be something uh, that actually today being a Monday, every yes. Monday we release an episode and uh, we just, yeah, I'm wondering in the chat, if there's any listeners out there, let us know. If not, we're definitely gonna... head on over. Uh, we have a blast. I got to say, we probably learned the most from doing the podcast because we're right in there, get to reflect on, on things. We do some mentoring moment episodes, all kinds of great stuff. And we bring amazing, amazing friends uh, on to the podcast to uh, to chat all mm -hmm. things math. Now, today we're going to be doing a bunch of different things, but in general, something that we focus on 
every single day is our thinking about how we can make more math moments in our classroom. That is something that uh, John and I have been on this quest for quite some time. I would argue every math teacher is on this quest where you're trying to find ways to engage your students in order for them to learn the content that, you know, we are passionate about sharing mm -hmm. with them. Right. And over time, we realize that it actually, it's not luck that we can actually create these moments. There are mm -hmm. ways, there's elements that we can uh, leverage each and every day in order to do that. And today we're going to be uh, trying our best to help you with some strategies that uh, might be helpful given the circumstances that we've been in over the past couple of years. Right, John? Yeah, totally, totally. And uh, so, so in in the session that we're going to kind of go through here tonight, we're hoping to pull some of these 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 ideas that help to create these math moments in our class. Like Kyle said, there there it's not luck. There 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 are things that we can we can do in our classroom. We're gonna we're gonna subtly mention those things, and we're gonna actually not subtly mention some other things and talk about what we can do in our math class to make these math moments that matter. Um, and Kyle's got a link on the screen. We'll throw that in the chat as well. Well, about where some of the tasks and, and ideas and the lessons that we've created over the years. We're going to share some of that here in this session as well. But we like to uh, point out th some of the things that if you stick with us in the session, what you will learn, what you will get by uh, by, by by staying with us. Um, and one thing in particular, since we've been talking about in the session title is. Uh, you know how to reach more kids after a two you know two toughest years so far we're going to we're going to talk about specifically what is worth focusing on moving forward and what isn't and i think we all kind of know that there are some things that we like ah oh, you know i notice a difference in what's happening in my classroom now versus what was happening before all of this and we want to talk about what should we be focusing on now um and what we shouldn't shouldn't be right Kyle? Mm -hmm, absolutely. And really what we're, uh, I mean, uh, this is something I hear a lot from educators. We hear it on Twitter. We've heard it on the show, on the podcast quite a bit. People are saying like, you know, there's gaps, like students are coming to us with unfinished learning. Like mm -hmm. they're, they, they maybe uh, didn't have, or maybe didn't uh, adapt well to the online structure, or maybe they just sort of got lost in the shuffle, right? Between online, back to face-to-face. -face. We've been on and offline a few different times over the past couple of years. And, you know, how do we actually help our students get ready for the next grade level. That seems to be mm -hmm. on our minds. Like we we take this responsibility that if we're going to send students off, whether I'm teaching grade one, whether I'm teaching grade seven, whether I'm teaching grade nine, whatever the grade level is, how do I help prepare them so that they're successful next year? We're going to talk about some of those mm -hmm. things. So not only what do we need to focus on, but then how do we help them so that they're still progressing? Right, John? Right. And then even, even deeper than that, Kyle, is where we're going to think about like not what, how do we help them there, but also how do we go about structuring our lessons to help these students and reach more learners, regardless of where they are in their readiness level. We've got students uh, all over the map. We all can agree on that, depending what grade level we teach, uh, but we can structure our lessons in a certain way to help as, uh, all of our students. And we want to talk about how to do that here this evening. Awesome. And we're going to give you some access to some resources that might help you in that journey to get you started on that journey, uh, not to fix all the problems, but to hopefully help you with thinking through what this might look like and sound like in your classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, but John, before yeah. we go any further, uh, we often reference all kinds of different reads mm -hmm. and all kinds of different learning that we are, you know, our own learning journeys. And actually recently uh, we, we read this book by Adam Grant called yeah. Think Again. And there's something that I think is worth us highlighting here before we dig into this sure. too tough year session that we're going to be doing tonight. Yeah. So I, I read this book and we read this book, uh, I think last, last year, and I recommended it to Kyle we, or, in, or Kyle recommended it to me. Um, but uh, this is not a math, a math teaching book. This is, this is not, uh, you know, a, a teaching book at all. This is a, this book is, is, is called Think Again, which is about the power of knowing what you don't know. And in, in a sentence, I guess this book is a, is a mass market book. It's for anybody of any top topic or any, anything. It's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a self-help type book, I guess, in the in the realm of social science. Uh, but the book is primarily about thinking about our understanding of what we know and what we don't know, and how to how to rethink our beliefs 
so that we we are on a better trajectory of learning because the book is about understanding that learning is not about confirming our existing beliefs but a, about evolving new beliefs and we can only do that by constantly reevaluating the beliefs we have by thinking about them again and that's the kind of the premise of the book but the book actually highlights uh, as a framework for all the stories it shares about how to rethink you know there's a there's a story about why blackberry you know came to the rise but then fell and like why why it didn't rethink some of its thinking structure when the iphone came up in the in the markets um, but every story in this book is framed with four mindsets and we want to outline um the uh, these four mindsets to help frame our thinking moving forward in this session. And hopefully you can use these mindsets to when you go back to your classroom and think, am I thinking like this or am I thinking like this? Or there's four mindsets. And the first one is when we think about any interaction we have with people when we're talking about uh, things we believe or, or our, our, our belief system or something we hold true. Um, one sometimes we act as a preacher. So a preacher, you know, we act as a preacher when we're we're sharing ideas, saying, you know what, I really think Ozark is the best show on TV, and I'm going to tell you exactly why I think that. And that's being a preacher when you preach to someone else or a group of people or wherever you are in a social setting. Um, you're telling them all the things why you think this is true. So you're preaching to the to the people that to kind of convince them to get your argument out there. This is one of the roles we take on when uh, we, we think about or, or interact with others um, when sharing or discussing beliefs. Kyle, what is the, uh, another, another mindset we take on uh, when we're interacting with people? Yeah. So the first one is more or less like you're out there and you're like spreading the word, right? Like you're right. spreading your belief. You're trying to share that uh, what you believe. And, and oftentimes you kind of wear that like a, a bit of a, a badge of honor oftentimes. Right. And then there's this other one where when let's say there's something out there that you disagree with. So that thing that maybe I might be preaching over here, uh, you might hear somebody say the opposite and you might come at them with this mindset, the prosecutor mindset, where mm -hmm. you're actually looking for flaws or those flaws actually jump out at you because you're like, wait a second, that doesn't work. That doesn't match my beliefs. And therefore, I'm going to prove why you're wrong. And we're going to go kind of for you to better understand what I believe. And that is that pr prosecutor sort of mindset. And when we think about this, this can actually um, this can actually like hurt us in the classroom a little bit, and you know, where we come at it and we look at things, you know, as if uh, we're using data. Uh, such as like how students perform on tests in order to prove why something doesn't work in the classroom instead of maybe um, realizing that, hey, maybe maybe that data is actually coming from some other aspect of the teaching practice. So that prosecutor mindset um, can be uh, kind of looking for those flaws. And that's something that, uh, you know, we're, we're actually going to try to move away from in this session here. John, how about our third yeah. mindset? What's the third one? The third one is a politician. And so a lot of times when we are interacting with people about our beliefs, we'll, we'll kind of like try to, you know, get them on our side. And this is the kind of like, I'm going to persuade you to be on our side. I'm going to campaign for you to be with me. And, and sometimes the, the, the politician will, um, you know, when you're acting as a politician, you might, you know, you might say something to gain some some popularity with a group, but you might not actually change your belief uh, in that conversation. So that's what the politician is. And, and basically, the book says that at any time we're interacting with people about our beliefs or our values or or just things in general, like sitting at the lunchroom table and having a conversation, we act uh, like these three. Sometimes we can act all three at the same time. We can act one or the other. Um, but you can imagine that you probably have found yourself in uh, one of these roles at one time when you're talking about, about something. But when we think about the classroom, Kyle kind of started to think about the classroom itself. And this is where we want to frame what we're talking about here this, this, this evening is when I think about my old teaching self, and I found myself primarily in these three categories uh, quite a lot. So when I think about the preacher, I was, I, I, I taught from this, you know, the front, we call that like the sage on the stage, right, Kyle? It's like, I was a, I was a, I was the, 
the the bearer of information. I would I would tell 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 the students how to do things. Um, I was a uh, rush to an algorithm type of teacher that would say, you know what? Here is our lesson. Here's let me show you how to do it. That was me preaching the math content at people uh, my students and and kind of like getting it out there. You can imagine that maybe you have found yourself in a preacher mm-hmm. mode as well in the classroom, Kyle. What about like I know you you talked a little bit about the prosecutor, but the prosecutor also is I think thinking about when you're in the classroom with students. I found myself as a as a prosecutor on thinking like judging the students' uh, thinking as either right or wrong. It's mm-hmm. like you you had talked about in the prosecutor. It was it was they were kind of uh, saying shooting down ideas. But when I think about a prosecutor in the classroom, acting like a prosecutor is like trying to make sure that the kids do it your way. You know, you know yeah. I used to find myself saying like, well, okay, you did it that solution, but well, let me, why don't you try this one over here? Or yeah, let's this, make this sure is going to be so much faster and more efficient. Right. So I'm going to like kind of prove to you why, why you want to do it this way, right. because your way is going to take too long. Or what if the numbers get too complex? And, you exactly. know, when, when you when you're a student and a teacher is sort of coming at you in this way, you can imagine that for some students that could actually shut them down, right? Exactly. Like they're 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 we want them to think, we want them to share, but if we're then going and saying no, no, that isn't the correct way, then we're we're not in a great in, in a great spot. And with the politician piece, that is like trying to convince our students of things, right? We mm-hmm. we can try till you're blue in the face to say, students, here's why you should do this or do that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, um, being the politician isn't necessarily going to do anything. It's almost mm-hmm. like we have to we have to change how we approach this in the classroom in order for students to see the need to complete their work mm-hmm. or see the need to put yeah. that extra effort in, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And and when we when we act with in these mindsets, whether you know at the lunchroom table with your your peers or in the classroom, like we've described here, what what happens is we can't move forward. You know, we can't we can't grow like the book was suggesting that that we're thinking about um, you know, how, how we can use learning to not confirm our understanding or confirm our understanding of what students know. We want to use these ideas to, you know, evolve what we know. We want to evolve what we know about our, our students, because if you stay in these, in these roles, what you're doing is you're really just living in this echoing chamber of, and you get this confirmation bias that happens when you are at the lunchroom table and you're trying to like preach these ideas and prosecute other ideas and politician the people around you in the classroom we're doing that as well we're kind of reconfirming things we already know and we're not learning anything new so that's how the book gets set up but the but the author Adam Grant talks more about a fourth role that we should take on more consistently which he calls the scientist if you think of the scientist, the scientist will make a conjecture and then they will go and test that conjecture. That's like what a scientist would do. And so there's, he says in the book that, you know, like about our beliefs, about our values, when we're interacting with people, we should have an open mind. We should think like a scientist. We could think, hey, I don't know what I don't know. And it's possible I'm wrong. I should hmm. gather evidence and, the, and let the evidence tell me what's the truth. And that's true, I think, in my life that I want to do that on a regular basis when I interact with my friends and my family. Uh, but I also want to be a scientist in the classroom. I want, I want to learn about what my students know or don't know. And I want the evidence to tell me that. And I don't want to think about being a preacher anymore. I want to be a scientist. I want to see what my students know and gather evidence to help them on their learning journey. Awesome stuff. So to set this up for today, we really want to start diving in and we want you to start thinking like a scientist with us. Okay. As much as maybe Mm -hmm. some of those other mindsets might be there, like we're human, right? Some of those things, you're going to have beliefs in your mind. You're going to have some of those things. And maybe some of those beliefs are helpful, right? Like we don't want to ignore everything that we bring to the table, but we want to keep an open mind. So what we want to do right now is give you an opportunity to do some sharing in the chat. And we want to ask you, because this is a question that keeps coming up. Teachers are saying, we don't have enough time to get the curriculum done. Students have gaps. 
think, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why, whether it's because of a new curriculum, because of a two year COVID pandemic, because of any other number of things, right? Socioeconomic status, anything could be affecting here. What we want to know from you is like, what do you think really matters, especially given your circumstance? Now, Here's the thing, though. As a scientist, I have to read what you're saying in the chat, and I have to respect the fact that your context may be very different than my context, and somebody else's context may be very different from your context. So we have to keep our minds open here. But I want to get you guys going in the chat right now. Share what are you thinking really matters for this school year? And I know that this school year, there's not a ton of time left, but there really still is at least a month and a half where we can still do some pretty important work. And let's be honest, these, whatever issues we're dealing with now aren't going to vanish over the summer, right? Like we're, we're going to have right. to continue this work into next year. So yeah. you can be thinking ahead as well. Right. John, what are we seeing coming up in the yeah, chat? Get here? your typing fingers ready. Type them in the chat. Hit enter when you are ready. Uh, let that flow happen. Um, I'm sure they'll they'll start to go. I've, I've seen a few already, Kyle. So for mm -hmm. example, Sharma says like develop thinking skills. I think that's an important one as well. Uh, learning to make connections. Uh, I see estimation. Growth. Yeah, estimation. Um, I'm seeing back at the top, uh, growth mindset and engagement and getting students engaged. And yeah, I'm going to push people. Like I, I saw someone said uh, getting a uh, grade and I'm going to say blank, like it doesn't matter. Getting grade blanks ready for blank, right? So grade six for seven, right. grade eight for nine. What does that mean though? Because like, how, how do I get them ready? Like what, what is right. it that we need to get them ready? And that, that's kind of what we're after here. We're going to yeah, um, definitely talk about that this, uh, this evening here. Um, we've got uh, learning to uh, accept differences and perceptions and productive mm. struggle. Uh, being challenged is okay from Julia. I love this is one. Understanding that there is no tricks. Yeah. That math uh, is not tricks. Right. Math is understanding. Math is sense making. I love that. Um, so, you know, we're going to keep rolling, keep these mm -hmm. coming in the chat, like definitely keep them, keep them rolling, keep thinking, be that scientist here with us. And I'm just mm -hmm. going to throw some content pieces up on the screen. And some of you, especially our elementary friends will notice some of these ideas here because they are our strands from the new curriculum here in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And one thing and one message that we're hoping that people will take away from our chat here today, and we will dive into some math. I think without, if we don't do the math, then it's really difficult to take this information and, and really like put it to use to implement it. But when we look at this and I see all of these things, like a lot of times we get teachers uh, and we've been there, like we, we know how this feels where you're like, ah, I just don't know if I'm going to have enough time to do it all. Like, look at all of that stuff. And really the messaging that we're feeling like the, what really matters here, what really matters to us are really two strands that all the other strands are going to feed into, right, John? Like we're mm -hmm. going to take this and we're going to kind of look at it and say, you know, if we look at those socio social emotional learning skills and mathematical processes and number sense and operations, like those to us are what really matter. Now we're not saying algebra doesn't mm -hmm. matter at all, but what no. we're saying is we want to use those to feed into these ideas. Exactly, exactly. So it's it's not saying like one comes before the other, but what we're saying is, I, and what we've found in the last year or so of working with these strands is that we can use these first two strands to fuel the discussion, fuel the learning of the other ones. And we can go through those uh, to get to the other ones. So, so I guess, right, the question is how, how, do, we, how do we focus on that, Kyle? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it comes down to, so for us, we're thinking, okay, I want to take every opportunity to help students build those math process expectations, to build those mm -hmm. SEL skills. Like I want them to have opportunities to do that in my math classroom each and every day. And these other strands are a means, they're almost like an opportunity for us to engage in them. So when I think about it and I go, okay, what is the intent right? What is the intent of my learning goal for tomorrow or my, my learning for tomorrow? I think about this and I go, okay, let's say that I'm working in spatial sense. 
I'm thinking about my spatial sense expectations, and I want to figure out how do I take those expectations and use them as almost like an excuse Hmm. to bring out these ideas, not the other way around. Like we don't want to like be like, okay, we did number in operations or we did SEL or we did the math process expectations. Those should be happening all the time. And of course, spatial sense, it would be great if that's happening all the time as well. But when I look at those specific expectations, I want to try to find ways that I can bring out these pieces. And before we tell you specifically Mm -hmm. what we're going to get after, um, I I think this is a great time for us to actually dig in and try to show how we can focus on these big ideas. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, Let's let's get into a little bit of math. We're going to we're going to outline a task that uh, that we've used. Kyle actually used it today in uh, one of the classes. By chance. Yeah, Uh, I used it a couple of weeks ago in my my class. Uh, we want to kind of walk walk you through what this could look like, but with the intent, what Kyle is saying is that we're going to use this as a as a kind of a vehicle to talk about some of these ideas that we should be doing on a regular basis about number and social emotional learning with skills in mathematical processes, which which is what we focus on as, as much as we can um, and, and as a priority, and mm-hmm. then the the kind of the specific learning goal pops out. Um, as a, as almost like a byproduct, right, Kyle? I love it. Yeah, exactly. And and that that is so key. It's like my end goal here isn't like that students know that specific right. expectation. It's that we use that expectation as a means to build their fluency and flexibility with number. Right. So it's like right? it's like the oh, my old self would have said today I'm going to make sure my students can do this skill, which was 2.1 from the textbook on this in this unit. Mm-hmm. And the skill I'm thinking of is what you know, like one of those very specific expectations. Um, and and then not and then going oh yeah, I probably will make sure that uh, I've got these other things in here like my problem solving processes you know, they'll, they'll come along for the ride, but no, what we like to do is how do I develop and start with the problem solving processes? How do I develop these, my, my fluency around number sense first, Mm -hmm. and can I incorporate this specific learning goal in here as well? So we're going to pop that in here and we're going to, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll revisit afterwards and kind of re re reiterate what we're talking about now and see if you can pick it up. Awesome. So what we'd like you to do is we actually would love you to wear two caps throughout this, but you're going to participate as a student, which means uh, we don't want you robbing the thinking of others. And I actually will say this to the class as well. I'll say this and I'll say, listen, if you if you think you know, right, if you know what's going on here, I want you to try to hold yourself back from robbing the opportunity for someone else to come to the same conclusion, have the same epiphany, Hmm. all right? As educators, it's highly likely that some may catch on to where we're going here. So I want you to be the student, but I also want you to continue being the scientist and thinking about this and thinking about the teacher moves that we're using and as we go here. So we're going to try to run this as we would with students, likely going to be faster than the process Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. we might use with students, right? So do keep that in mind. Um, But we believe that our learners, our group that we're working with, are likely going to be at a different place than some of our students who may have been in the classroom when we're doing this. Right. So let's get our uh, typing fingers ready. uh, We're going to show you a very short, short clip. Um, And at the end of the clip, it's actually going to ask you to uh, notice and wonder a few things. So get your typing mm-hmm. fingers ready. Kyle's ready saying ready, right in the chat, make sure you can see the chat. Um, so he's going to hit play and, uh, Hey, we want you to, you might play it a couple times. Hey, eh, Kyle. Yeah, I'll definitely play a couple times. Anything and everything goes here. Yeah. What do you know? Judgment. Nothing is too obvious. Nothing is bad. Mm-hmm. Nothing is not worth sharing here. Exactly. All right. Our math community is very accepting and very, very open. Uh, so I'm saying ready, but no one is ready, John. Like no one Wait, is. Give us ready. a ready if you're ready. Okay. Whew. There we go. I thought Barbara's we was ready. Off Heather's there. I thought ready. the internet. I Anybody's the internet ready. Went Sharma's down. ready. Okay. Grace is ready. All right. Here on, we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Check it out. Here we go. at the ready. Go. Whew. Some of you were born ready. I know it. I know it. Okay. Now my, right. my wonder. It. There it was. That's it. Play it again, okay. Kyle. Play it again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to do it again. Nobody wrote anything yet. 
Let's see some noticing. Let's see some wonders. What do you think? Uh, we see a square. I like it. Play it again. I like it. Let's Here see. It Ooh, parallelogram. Mm, interesting. Ooh. Oh, why asymmetrical? I like that wonder. All right. All right. All right. All right. Ooh, one more time, Kyle. Okay. One more time. All Let, right. All right. Bit more. What do you notice? What do you wonder? Try to get a couple in each. Yes. Don't, you don't have to rate just one. Feel free to notice. Feel free to wonder as well. All right. Some friends are saying like, I wonder what the area or the perimeter might be of each. Mm. Uh, how is the area divided? Uh, the angles, like, and how do they relate to one another? Awesome. Awesome. Noticing awesome wonders. Some of the students uh, today were saying things like, um, I think I see a square in a square. And I loved that the student mm. articulated, they think. And I asked them, like, why are you not certain? And they said, well, I, I don't know for certain. There's nothing to tell me for certain that, th that it is squares. And I was like, that's actually, that's a really great point. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of people would make the assumption and that's okay too, if they did. But I, I really want to dig into that with those students. Uh, lots of stuff. We have people talking about spatial sense, all kinds of awesome stuff, getting kids to just notice. And something I told the kids today, and I do this with any new classes that I do lessons uh, with, is I say, I intentionally tell them why we do this. And it's to turn your brain on and prime it for learning because your brain is primed. It's trained to try to ignore things that don't matter. There are so many things your brain has to ignore in a day to save energy and it will only remember things that it feels are is important. So what we're doing is we're priming the brain for learning. And a lot of students tend to like really like that idea that they're like, right. oh, okay, I get it now. It's not like a waste of my time. Right. We're just and, noticing. And, and I was just going to jump in here, Kyle. If I have been a preacher in my class uh, up to this point and I'm doing this, then this is also priming your brain to get ready because that note, you know, in my preaching days, uh, I would ask, you know, I would just say today we're going to learn about this. And then I would show everybody how, how to kind of go about that particular learning goal or this particular learning goal. And uh, no time was I asking my students to voice their, their, what they thought about any of the things that were, were going, were going on in that particular lesson. So we're priming our brain to get ready to use it, to do a little bit, uh, a little bit more depth, uh, in depth here. I love it. So we've got all kinds of noticing and wondering going on here. I, I have a challenge here for you, friends. And uh, I, I love these these wonders here. And these are all great things that we mm -hmm. can get to with students as well. Like if, if you want to explore them with students as well, amazing, awesome. But I do have a challenge for you here. It's a very specific challenge. And I'm wondering, just based on what you see up on the screen, I'm wondering about how many of these right here, this little orange square. I wonder how many of those will it take to fit mm -hmm. in this square right here? And I'm going to confirm to you right now that this is a square inside of a square. Hmm. And uh, there is no tricks here. There is no lies. I do not lie to students. Um, so my wonder for you, I'd love to get some friends sharing their estimates. Uh, many of you have been with us before and know that we like to frame it just like a Dan Meyer at uh, Andrew Stidell might with uh, this low or high, like what's too low, what's too high. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Today, because of time, I would love it if we can actually just zoom in on your best estimate based on just what you see here, which is mm -hmm. your spatial reasoning and a bit of your intuition. So we're going to give right. you a little bit of time to feel see free, what we come yeah, up with. Yeah, feel free to throw a sentence uh, as well on the end of your estimate, uh, just to kind of like go, to kind of like hint at where your thinking might come from on your estimate. Um, is yeah, it just I love a eleven, park, or is it uh, is it like, hey, I'm just, uh, you know, what I saw this and I saw this and I think that. Yes, that can help with some framing. I love it. I loved, uh, I saw 11 teen. So when I see 11 teen, what, what that makes me think of uh, right away is uh, a little bit of James Tanton. Yeah. Uh, but it also makes me realize, well, wait a second, 11 teen, that would be like 110, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. 11 teen. So I'm going to do that. 110 is one. Uh, what else are you seeing in the chat, John? Let's get a, a few of these uh, estimates. I'm seeing a here. few 400s, a 625, uh, yeah. 400s, a 1500. 
Whoa, 400 um, and then 1500, like 1500's yeah. way over here. Yeah, yeah. That makes me like, I'm always wondering like, uh, you know, how, how like this gut and I, shot and this gut shot are so different. And it, it's interesting. Like this yeah. is four times bigger ish. Yeah. And this is like, you know, basically three times bigger ish. Uh, so we've got a big range so far. Would yeah, you agree? We got 80 as a, as a, a smallest so far. We've got a 225 and a uh, hundred ish from Heather. Yeah. It's just, uh, is be, it is, it is to be an X square where X could be between 10 and 12. Mm. So a square so between 10 and 12 and 144. And 144. One there. Okay. Let me do that. That's mm -hmm. an interesting mm -hmm. uh, approach. I like that. So we can see we've got quite the range here today. And of course, uh, something that we like to announce to students is like when we estimate that range might be really wide, but I'm wondering like if we can actually get a little bit closer mm -hmm. now, John, now let's pivot a little bit, right? Kyle? Yeah. Like, like we, we emailed uh now, if you, if you were like, if you were on your email this evening, we were like, you know what, let's give, let's give them a little template that we use with our students. Uh, and you used it with your students today. We'll email it out. See if anybody prints it out. If not, no worries. Kyle's going to put it up uh, a little bit bigger on the screen so you can see it. Um, but if you have printed this out now, let's, let, let's give them a little bit of insight, Kyle. This diagram is not exactly the same as the di diagram we have up on the screen, but no. it's pretty much the same. Uh, same same kind of layout, um, same kind of uh, yeah, and, and I, around that. And I'm going to confirm that like we still have a square and yep. we still have another square inside. So we have the same situation. But something that I will mention is that actually here, our unit of measure is not the same. Right. So we're not like, you know, this square may be a little more tilted this way or that. Th those pieces I cannot confirm or deny for you right at right. This so point. we're going to do like, it's almost like we're going to do two rounds. So we're going to give you this. This is what we get with our students. We're going to give, we give them this printout at this point and say, okay, you know what? Like, we're going to give you this and we're, we're going to ask you to represent your thinking. Um, you can, you can take this page, you can draw on it. Um, mm. You can use the, the, you know, the, the filled in square, like uh, you cut can, it out, you can cut it out. You can use the one that's like blank. Um, you can cut pieces out. You could cut the, you know, along the dotted lines. You could do whatever you want to do to kind of like help demonstrate your thinking on helping decide how many, you know, little squares, which are now the, the, the grid lines on this grid, how many squares would fit in the middle square. And then what we'll do is we'll pivot back to the one that we showed you already on the screen. So we're doing a kind of two rounds here that look similar. So now, in the chat, you gotta, you gotta take a moment here. Um, maybe you wanna, you could draw it on a piece of paper on your, on your, on what you printed. If you didn't, maybe you've got a notebook handy and you can draw it on there. Maybe you're on a tablet with us right now and you can mm -hmm. draw your thinking on that. Um, we want to you to represent your thinking some way. So we want to actually remember we're pretending you're in our math class and we want to grab this from you, um, in a few different ways this evening. And one way would be to type some thinking in the chat. Another way would be you, if you are okay with it, holding your picture up to the camera and turning up on your camera, we have that option here in now, this meeting. Now, John, I also want to mention here, like, I want you thinking like what your students might do. Mm -hmm, I want you to anticipate. So there's some people in the chat sharing that they clearly have some prior knowledge that maybe students may not have. Because when I did this with students today, they did not have the prior knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. They had basically what they brought with them, which was not necessarily a very full plate of, right. you know, their past couple of years, uh, which, which was evident. So I want you thinking about what might students in your classroom do, and maybe think about the different students in your class. What might you see? Because we're not pre-teaching them here. We're not saying, Hey, if you do this, this, and this, we're not preaching to them. No, we're, we're not going scientist. to prosecute them either. We're not going to be the prosecutor and say that the way you did that is not good enough. We want to see where students are. And as a scientist, that will help us take information and then say, okay, where do we need to go next? So I'm wondering what would students 
actually do. We'll give you about, uh, I don't know, another minute, and then we will start sharing some of what we saw. Yeah. And it also what you could do is turn your mic on and talk and, and, and verbalize. And I'll, yeah. And I'll try to uh, facilitate what you're saying and, and what, you're, uh, what you're doing. So in class, just to help for those who are here and, and sort of thinking about this, in the classroom, students are working together. Students are raising their hands saying, ooh, 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 I want to tell you. And I'm saying, oh, don't share with me, share with a neighbor. And I'm walking around listening to their discussion, but I don't want to be the person in the discussion. I want to be listening to their discussion. So I say, oh, try to convince a neighbor. Oh, you think you've got an idea? Share it. Do they understand your idea? If they don't, then maybe you need to work on how you're going to make that more clear for them to understand your thinking. And I'm trying to just listen and observe and think about which solutions should I be bringing to the front as strategies uh, to share with the room as we go. All right, John, what do you say that we uh, we start uh, sharing? Uh, we're going to start mm-hmm. with probably a, the most accessible Mm -hmm. The most accessible method. Um, I saw this one today and I actually had a student in this. It was a grade nine classroom, took some of the extra grid paper after cutting out their template and they actually cut out one square Mm -hmm. and they started iterating it over top. Just one and they just kept moving it? Just one. And that told me a lot about where that student was because that student was iterating one square and they were using more of like a counting approach in order to find the area, which at that point, I don't think the student made the connection that that's what we were actually finding was Mm. area here because we did not make that explicit yet. No, we didn't. We said how many of these little squares. Um, uh, Kyle, did they count and count and count or did they uh, eventually like have a row and then go, hey, you know what? I've got another row or did they just keep it or lay, uh, you know, putting the one everywhere? I think once they got to the end of one row, then they did another row and then they started to count by tens. Mm-hmm. So they had their tens there gotcha. and came to the conclusion that it was 100. Something else that I saw that I thought was um, actually I did not anticipate a student had cut out this square. And Mm -hmm. as they cut it out, I was watching and I was ready to be so excited. And then the student proceeded to put it here like this. Yeah. And then this is tried to estimate using. Right. Right so they, they placed it in the exact same positioning. Mel- in Melanie in the same. chat has said, traced the square. And you, you said they did that too, I think, when you showed me earlier. They had actually traced the edge of that square. Um, and, then, and then Melanie is saying, and counted the squares. So that's, that seems similar. Now, Mel, I'm wondering if Melanie means exactly the way Kyle's student did it today, like placed it in the same position. Or do you think, Melanie... Uh, that uh, uh, maybe you're anticipating that the student or maybe your solution is not that exact placement. She can show us a picture. Perfect, Melanie. Feel free to uh, toss your camera on there. Yeah, this uh, a student in the classroom did this and traced it and then went out and started approximating. I had another student who did something similar to this and then started making rectangles. Yeah. So when I look at Melanie's, I'm kind of, I got to, I got to, I'm getting, re- you can see me getting real close to the camera here. Uh, uh, when I see Melanie's, it, it looks kind of like what your student had done. Um, started counting the squares inside that sh- exact placement of that, uh, of that diagram. Interesting stuff. Interesting mm-hmm. stuff, mm-hmm. Cal. Interesting. Absolutely. And what we did see some students, one that I thought was really clever was a student actually determined that, well, if they took this, and let me get another one here, they took this, and they took this square, and they placed it here Mm. to determine that this was a 10 by 10, 100 uh, cube, or or, sorry, 100 square um, area. And Mm. then they proceeded to use their neighbors that look like this, and they actually went and they said, well, they knew that if this is 100 and they figured out that, well, wait a second, this was, I believe it was 14 by 14. And students, uh, we did this no calculators, by the way, 
Um, so we had some students, we said, how are you going to figure out then what 14 by 14 is? And then we had an opportunity to actually mm. look at the distributive property with partial products by decomposing our 14 into 10 and four and 10 and four. Right. Now, Kyle, Kyle, you did this during the lesson, correct? This was during the, yeah, exactly. Students, yeah. students were sharing and I was trying to facilitate right. their thinking. I, I love it. I love it. Now, can you, because I, I know that some folks and I, my old self would have said this too, Kyle, it said like, look, why, why, why not allow them to use calculators? Because Kyle, aren't you going to derail the lesson? Because now you have to talk about how to multiply like you're showing. Like, why, why would we not, you know, allow calculators? And in, in, in we would think this is not actually derailing the yeah, lesson. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I would say for me, once again, going back to the reason that we're doing this learning is to give students the opportunity to get better at the things that we are constantly saying they are not fluent and flexible with. Right. So in this case, if you've ever said students do not know their math facts or they aren't flexible with numbers or they don't know this or they don't know that, this is an opportunity for us to give students the ability to build these skills and to see that, you know what, I actually can, I can mm -hmm. decompose this, these numbers in any way I choose it just seems that 10 and four seem to be very, mm -hmm. uh, very helpful. And not only that, but if I want to get them ready for the next grade, this was a grade nine class we were working with. Mm -hmm. If this is the grade nine class, and today I'm working on a spatial reasoning expectation, and I give them the opportunity to build their number and operational sense and basically set them up perfectly. Because what we just did here is we took 14 times 14. And we turned it into something that's easier for them to solve, but not easier for them to solve next year algebraically, unless they've already done this work. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. next year, when I go into grade 10 and I'm asking them to multiply binomials and students already understand how partial products works, there is no need for FOIL because it looks like this. Mm -hmm, exactly. I'm building my area, my measurement, and my number sense, which will extend to algebra because next year, instead of 10 and four, it's gonna be X plus four and X plus four, or it's gonna be X plus four squared. And I'm building towards fluency for the next grade level. So for teachers who are saying, I need to get them ready for next year, this work is necessary. It's not, it's not just something that we, you know, we want to do, or we don't want to do because we don't want to derail. It's actually, to me, this is the important part of the lesson. Mm -hmm. So these students were able to put this together and say, well, okay, if this is 140, 80, 96, this is 196. Students took this and they said, okay, well, if this is 196, we see that right here. There's my 196. We know that this is 100, and you can see right there, there's my 100, all right? So I have 100 right here. And some students simply subtracted. But other students, I then asked them, I said, like, what's the area of just one of these triangles? Just to see, like, what are they going to do? Like, what's their strategy now? And one of the most remarkable things happened. I had one student who was just quietly in the back and they just folded just like this. Now, I think Ian was trying to show you that he did oh, that, Kyle. Oh, Ian, you're the best. And I wasn't, I wasn't working in Ian's virtual class today, but I have worked in Ian's virtual class a few times, which is pretty awesome. Uh, but Ian, were you doing something similar to kind of like these? There it is. He's showing you. Oh, I love it. I love it, Ian. That's fantastic. I love it. And how many were missing there, my friend? How many were missing, Ian? I approximated four. I love it. I had a student who then did this and they said, yeah, it looks like four. They all kind of eyeballed it. And then another student just like took a piece of the grid paper and just kind of put it up against. I thought I had some. Here it is. They kind of put it, up it in there. there. Look at that. And they said, you know what? Yeah, that's that's four.
look at that. And they said, okay, so I basically, I have, I have a hundred minus four. That's going to give me 96 for each of these triangles. And then of course they used partitive division to divide it amongst the four, the four triangles. And now they have the area of each triangle. Other students, John, took what, these triangles. Yeah, like there were some people that cut together. some triangles out, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like some students cut the triangles out and they did this. And they said, you know, if I like take this and I take this, they were like, I can just use the formula for area of a triangle, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But other students said, well, I could find the area of a rectangle by just finding the area of that rectangle right there, yep, yep, which I think yep. was six by eight. Yep. And I like interestingly it. enough, like some students were like, Ooh, six times eight. They didn't know what that was. I was like, hmm, that's a tough one. Six groups of eight. I was like, I wonder, do you know three groups of eight? And they were like, yeah, it's 24. I'm like, so do you know six groups of eight? And they said, Oh, 48. I'm like, exactly. Nice work. So 48 here, wait a second, 48 with these two uh, with these two uh, triangles, I wonder where's my other triangles, huh? Actually, I don't know where they are, John. Uh -oh. I don't know where I put them. Uh -oh. Maybe they're under. Are here. they underneath? Yeah, they've got to be. I thought I had some extra, I hope but so. maybe not. Oh, there's just so many around here. Oh well, I, I think I've lost them. That's all right. Oh, but, bummer. But yeah, so students had all these different ways, and we got to build and actually allow students to leverage the area model in multiple ways to build their number fluency. They also are building their spatial reasoning skills by being able to take these shapes, decompose them and recompose them in different ways. Mm -hmm. And then we actually asked them and we said, okay, well, listen, if you know the relationship between this big square, which was 196, and this square here is 100, and you also told me, wait a second, you knew these were 96, which Holy smokes, you're telling me that these four triangles actually, whoa, they actually like take up this amount of space over here. That's interesting. If I decompose these in a different way, that's really interesting. And then we went back and said, I'm wondering, what about this one here? What if I, what if I give you the length of this side and the length of that side? And we were to ask you, can you update your estimate? now. And this is the opportunity for students to now go ahead and actually leverage some of what they've learned to apply it to a similar situation, but with different values and really not as accessible because now they don't have the actual physical manipulatives to be able to simply mm -hmm. cut it out and look at a grid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's great. You wanna, and and I know that you, you had some students sliding some triangles around and, and, and Chris is saying, turn the triangles because we, we had lost two. Um, but if we go back to that slide, Kyle, you want to, we, we could also kind of progress and push kids um, once they've kind of practiced those skills and, and figured out how many are in that big square, knowing that each of those are 12 and 16 side lengths for those triangles. Um, but uh I know that a little bit, a little bit later, we were sliding some triangles around, and also we saw some really cool uh, and really interesting properties of this diagram. Absolutely. So while some people may have noticed this initially, uh, other people may not have noticed it yet. There's something sort of magical hidden here that students will, after we give them the opportunity to work, that they can actually look and see that, well, wait a second, like there's something going on here that they can play around and they can start manipulating here. And if we actually look at this and we were to, let's, so let's like go the green areas no, are no, are the same, no matter where they are on that space. Exactly. But, exactly. But if I, if uh, we had a student and I had a student in my class, move them to the, like the left side and go, you know what, if, when I do that, then the areas of the two you know, empty squares on the left side of the screen, you know, 16 by 16 is 256. And they're saying, you know what, that's part of the area if I didn't ar rearrange them because mm. we gave them that two diagrams side by side. And I said, you know what, the, the other empty square now on the left side is a 12 by 12 square. 
and uh, that uh, that that's filling up as we speak. Uh, and then that part is going to be 144 in just a moment, but that's going to be the rest of that big square. And then all of a sudden, there's some really interesting things here, right? Like you can get obviously adding those two smaller squares add to the larger square and you do get 400 uh you get 400 little tiny squares on this particular example and uh as i said the, the there's some really cool things that happen here if you look closely on this triangle um right cal absolutely and if i slide one of these out and i actually were to take this and go well wait a second like if we look at this and we slide this over here and I say, well, hang on a second. Like, what do I have here? I've got this one right here and I've got, I'm dropping my, uh, your squares, dropping all my pieces all over the place here. This one goes right here. Yeah. That's and, that square. Okay. And then like, let's take my other two triangles and let's, Oh, you them found there. them. I did find them. Yeah. I found them. They fell here. They are. So let's have a look here. And I'm just going to put this over here. And if I just take, like, if I just take one. Yeah, of look these, at one triangle. Like, if I just take one of these and I put it there and then I just, I noticed, noticed that this, like, I can almost take it with it, right? And like, I see that right there. And then like, I look at this one here and I go, well, wait a second. Those are the same side length. So like, this one goes here. And we knew, we knew that by rearranging that we got this hundred here and actually look at, look at that, this, this longest side length gives us this right here. We get this really interesting relationship and we get to introduce this through the work that students did. So once again, as the scientist, we're now giving the students the opportunity to discover by asking them very specific questions that they're able to answer. We didn't say right from this from the get-go, like tell us the side length of the hypotenuse. We didn't say that. We we asked them for different measures. And then through those different measures and those relationships, we're able to manipulate what we have to build that number sense, that fluency, problem solving, uh, modeling, strategizing, all of those pieces in order to develop this expectation which is the Pythagorean theorem. Now, this might not happen in one lesson, this is, but this is where we want to go with this thinking. So this was the expectation that we were exploring, but notice how it wasn't like, th like the light wasn't shining only on Pythagorean theorem. It was shining on these other pieces over here. Mm -hmm. These mm -hmm. are the important pieces. And it was an excuse for us to dig deep in this thinking right there. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, I, and I think that that when we think about what really matters in our class, we're going to go back to that. It, it's this idea that we want to develop fluency as much as we can. We want to develop um, number sense. We want to develop this social emotional learning with our students. And we can get to the concepts from the specific expectations, like using the Pythagorean theorem or the triangle relationships um, through the, you know, strengthening these skills that we know students need more practice with. Absolutely. So really the goal here is like, we want to begin, like, how do we do this every day? We want to begin with a problem right here. We didn't really have like a story, but there was a provocation there, right? There was definitely something there. We wanted to make sure that there was a low floor and a high ceiling. Everyone could access that student who counted one by one all the way to that student who was able to apply formulas that they had brought with them. Uh, we want to make sure that we're revealing big ideas and truths about the math, and we want to emerge strategies and models throughout the thinking. We don't want it to just be a, a light shining on one specific expectation. So that for us is one of the biggest pieces here. So when we go back to think about what really matters, this is something that you as the scientists have to do. You have to reflect and think, what can I do from now to the end of the school year? And what am I going to do next year in order to reach those goals or help my students reach those goals? So, John, let's go through a few things that we hope we gave friends with. Uh, we'll drop some links in the chat for anything mm -hmm. that they need. Mm -hmm. And uh, let, let's first of all start with 
uh, our first what you'll get. Make sure yeah. you let us know in the chat if you feel like you're getting a little bit of this from today's session. Yeah, hold us accountable. Did we do this? Uh, we want to talk specifically about what we should be focusing on, what we should focus on now, and what we shouldn't focus on. Let us know in the chat. Give us a yes if we did that here in this session. We said we were going to. We hope we you we we pulled that out for you. Give us a yes in the chat. Oh, we Pat, got a else? we. I love it. I love yeah. it. Awesome. Uh, hopefully, you feel like you you saw some ways that you can help students get ready for the next grade level. Like today, we gave some examples of what that might look like. Let us know. It looks pretty good in the chat. John, keep going. Yeah, and uh, we've talked about, or we wanted to help you understand how you might go about structuring your lessons. Hopefully, you saw how we could do that with the one, this one particular. But thinking about all your lessons, how can you reach more uh, learners, regardless of their readiness level, by structuring them this way? Well, there, math moment makers. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Uh, I know that both John and I really enjoyed actually putting it together and thinking through some of these these challenging problems, these challenging questions that might be going through your head. Um, maybe you know, I know that a lot of educators I've I've worked with sort of feel like should we just be doing and then fill in the blank, right? Mm -hmm, should we mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. go back to you know, direct instruction, because like, we'll, we'll cover more quote unquote, cover yeah, more. We got to get um, caught up. Yeah. But like at the end, I hope that what people are taking away from this is really, we want to help students become fluent and flexible. We want them to become numerate, right? We want mm -hmm. them to be comfortable with number and operations. So look at your curriculum expectations or your standards, depending on where you are in the world and look at them through that lens. How can you reach more students and help them build that number sense and build that fluency uh, from, uh, I don't know if you heard Paisley there, but <laughs> yeah, I heard Paisley's him. in the I background. Heard, heard her. Uh, it's a her. But it, it, is a, it is a her. Um, so I, I hope that you, you take that message away and you start realizing that, wait a second, I know that maybe things aren't the way they were before these two years, but let's make sure that we don't start getting back into uh, old habits, even though we're dealing with a few struggles. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, one of the biggest things that I think we talked about in this particular episode um, that uh, I, I've stuck with and, 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 and trying to implement as much as I can is thinking about those big ideas. What are the things we want our students to walk away with? And how can we focus on those using our curriculum, our standards as a way to get at those? Um, hopefully you, you saw an example if you're here on YouTube with us or you heard about the example that we talked about if you're listening over on our podcast about how do, how do I bring in like the ideas of number sense and problem solving and reasoning and proving uh, and posing important problems uh, while you're while you're using the, your content and your standards to get at these other big ideas. So hopefully we've got some messages there and some big key takeaways for you. Those are our key takeaways. And uh, hey, in order to ensure you don't miss out on our new episodes as they come out each week, be sure to hit the subscribe button wherever you are listening to this right now so that you can get next week's episode automatically delivered right to you. We put them out on every Monday morning early and also over on the YouTube page. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Yes. And uh, this episode in particular uh, is really helpful on YouTube. Uh, you get to see and, you know, experience uh, the examples and some of the visuals that we put together uh, to hopefully reiterate some of the messaging that you heard here today. So definitely hop on over there. Um, my friends, we are looking for more Math Mentoring Moment episodes uh, for you. So if you have a pebble in your teacher's shoe that is shaking around and you want to discuss it on an upcoming Math Mentoring Moment episode, make sure you head over to makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor uh, because we are scheduling for the next couple of months, in particular over the summer months, we love to try to dig in with as many educators as we possibly can uh, to get us ready for next school year. So start thinking ahead. I know that some people are thinking spring. Uh, they're thinking, or at least here on the in the upper in the northern hemisphere, are thinking summertime is coming. And uh, sometimes we want to sort of like take a little bit of time off. But let's start thinking ahead. So hop on with us over at MakeMathMoments.com forward slash mentor. 
so that we can dive into an episode with you and uh, try to shake out that pebble that might be in your shoe. Show notes and links to resources from this episode uh, and all the examples that we shared here can be found over at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 182. Again, that's makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 182. Well, until next time, my Math Moment Maker friends, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. Hey, and a big high five just for you.